April the 9th, 1996. This is an interview with Pearl Taylor. Is that your full name? Pearl Taylor. That's it. That's it. That's all they gave me. Only they named me Pearly, but the doctor put Pearl on my birth certificate. Why Pearly? Because her girlfriend's name was Pearly Hubbard. Your mother's girlfriend? My mother's girlfriend. Mm -hmm. When were you born? October the 15th, 1919. Where at? In Harlan County. No, it wasn't either. It was in Kentucky County, Blackmont, I believe they called it. In Harlan County? It was part of Harlan no, County? No, it was in Kentucky someplace. I really don't know. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I was there, but I don't remember. But it was called Blackmont? Uh-huh. Okay. Blackmont. Okay. I think that was the post office then, but it's not anymore. And your parents' names? Frances Marion Cup and Nanny Helen Gross Cup. <laughs> okay. Um, tell me about your um, parents. What did your father do? My father was a coal miner. He worked in the coal mines until I was about nine years old. And then he quit, but he would work on the farm for a little while. Well, and then he'd go to the coal mines and he'd work in the coal mines a little while, I think until he thought he'd get rich. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd go back to the farm. He thought he could live, but nobody could ever live on the farm, so he'd go back to the coal mines. So he, he moved us back and forth from the coal mines to the farm until I didn't get any education. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did pretty well with no education. <laughs> well, maybe I did, but... I just always felt like I was cheated. See? When you say back and forth, um, what do you mean by back and forth, from county to county? No, from, yeah, from, from Whitley County, Kentucky to Harlan County, Kentucky. Whitley County was where we owned a farm, and then Harlan County was where the coal mines was. And I have known him moving twice in one month in the coal mines because um, Let's say, for instance, we lived at uh, Verde. If Sunshine was paying more money, he would move to Sunshine. And if High Point was making more money, he'd move to High Point. And then if, if uh, he'd seen another one that was making more money, he'd move there. Wherever they paid more for the coal that they dug, that's where my dad would move. And the farm, where was it located? It was lo located about eight miles out of Corbin, Kentucky, in Whitley County. And I went to school to Frankfurt School, which was just a one-room school with all eight grades there. But when I lived in the mining camp, they had the schools in separate age, age groups or grade levels like they do now. But in Whitley County, there was just one room there was about, I would say, about 50 children, and uh, they had what they called primer then, all the way through eighth grade. And all of those classes was in this one room with one teacher. Did you have the same teacher the whole time at Frankfurt? The, no, just for one year. The teacher was just there one year at a time. And then they, the next year, while well, we'd have another teacher, one year we might have a man teacher and then a woman teacher. When you were in Harlan County, you went to school then in the mining camps. They had their own schools, is that right? Yes. Each mining camp had their own school. And, well, they, just like they are now, the age groups or the grade levels was separated. What um, particular kinds of subjects did you like best in school? We didn't. I don't know if I liked any of them. <laughs> <laughs> but you wanted to get an education, though. I wanted, I wanted very much to get an education. I remember one time I wanted to do art so bad, and I never asked Mom and Dad to get me any crayons. I wanted to, I wanted to color so bad, and the teacher, she was given a prize for the one that drew the best mouth. And I remember I went to the creek bed, and I got different colors of rock and I covered, colored my picture. I don't remember what grade I got on it, but I colored it with different grade, 
dif different colors of rocks. Mm. It turned out pretty good, too. <laughs> You'd be surprised what kind of beautiful rock colors there was it is in a creek bed. <laughs> what um, were the uh, schools like in Harlan County as compared to the Frankfurt School? Really, I was only nine when we left there, about nine, between nine and ten. And I didn't have as much fun there as I did in the one-room school because in the one-room school it was a lot. You had more friends, but in Harlan County you was with your own age group and they had no games or anything for us to, we just got out and played on the school ground and watch for the train to come and we'd all line up and wave at the caboose. <laughs> the people in the caboose and the engineer, he would always wave at us. They'd hang their heads out the windows and in the caboose, which you don't have any cabooses nowadays, which that was a lot of fun. See all those guys hanging their heads out. I was just a little bitty girl, but I, I really enjoyed waving to them. <laughs> in uh, Harlan County, uh, in, in the mines, what did your dad do in the mines? He loaded coal. He dug it out they would bring cars back in there and they got paid so much for every car they loaded and he made good money i mean good money them days so he was like deep in the mine then. he was deep in the mine he was way in there maybe miles i don't really know but i know it would take him a long time to get in because they had they had uh, motors on the cars and the men would ride into the place, they, they called them rooms, where they were digging coal. They were all lighted out in rooms, and they had to make sure their slate overhead was propped with, with wooden props so that it wouldn't fall. And the men that didn't prop it up good would have a, a slate fall and uh, get killed. Did you realize when you were so young uh, how dangerous the work was that your dad did? Yes, because uh, they was always, uh, see my mother was an epileptic, and there was always, the whistle would blow when someone would get killed, and it was almost every day someone would get killed. And that whistle would blow, they called it the wildcat, and my mother would start into those seizures every time. and. Uh, it was, yeah, we, I think as a very small child, I realized how dangerous it was. Did that scare you, bother you regularly? How did you handle that as a small child? I really don't know. I just can't remember. Um, because I know I had forgot so many things, and I know it was because of fear that I just put it out of my mind and didn't try to remember it because now that I look back at it, I can see how afraid, afraid of that I was for my dad because uh, there's so many things that I can't remember. I've tried and I just cannot bring them back to my memory. How did you view, how did you view your dad uh, when you were growing up? Oh, my dad was special. I would brag on my dad. My dad was six foot tall and he weighed 199 pounds and I was very proud of him. Very proud of him. I'd tell other kids, your dad's little. Mine's a big man. <laughs> and I was, was, I guess all children like to brag on their daddy or mommy, <laughs> but uh, I was very proud of my dad. Tell me about your mom. My mom was, well, she grew up with a large family. Mom was very high-tempered. And before my mom become a Christian, she just didn't call you a bad name as to call you a good name if she didn't like you. She was very high-tempered. But my mom, you couldn't ask for a better person, a loving person, a kind person. If you were in need, my mom was there. She was there to help you. My mother was a midwife when we lived in in Whitley County. After we moved there permanently, why she had uh, she had a midwife's license to deliver babies, 
and she delivered, I guess, every baby that's uh, anywhere from 50 years old up to 80 years old now, she delivered them that lives in Whitley County if they were originally there. And I filled out their birth records. And uh, she would go to homes and deliver those babies, and we had a big black mare that she always rode. One time, I remember she went to deliver this baby, and when she came home, it was so cold that there was icicles hanging from her hair. And another time I remember she went, this one has always stuck out in my mind so strong because the, it was twin babies, they were premature, and she told me that their heads would have fit in a, in a teacup. They were so tiny. The people didn't have any food. They were eating poke salad. It was all they had to eat. No wonder the babies were so tiny. The mother didn't have any food. My mother was gone for, when she was gone, overnight or t uh, 12 hours, my dad would walk there, wherever she was at, he would walk there. And uh, this time he walked over there and found out they didn't have any food. And he come back home and we had what we called a meal bag that he took to the, to the mill and had uh, corn ground in for our cornmeal. And he got that meal bag, he got two of them and he filled each one of them as full as he could with canned can stuff that we had in our cellar. And he took them back over there so those people could have something to eat while the, the mother was getting well from having the babies. Both the babies died. She couldn't save them. And she just, she was so hurt because they were in so much in need. But I've seen her do that so many times. She was such a kind, and loving person. What do you remember about your grandparents? Tell me, tell me who your grandparents were and what you remember about them. George Gross and Polly Gross. Her maiden name was Hall. I barely can remember Grandma because um, she died when I was six years old. And the reason I know I was six years old because my brother, Andrew, he was born when I was six years old, and she died, I think she died the 1st of June, and he was born like on the 15th of June, but she had cancer, and they, they called it rose cancer, and it ate both of her breasts off. I saw her lay in the bed, and, and this big sore just started on one side, and it just spread to the other side, and my mother waited on her. And all the family, my mother, my grandmother and grandfather were very wealthy people. They owned a, a grocery store and they had everything they needed. And, and in my grandmother's lifetime, she owned three or four homes there in um, Birdie, Kentucky. And... Um, That's in Holland County? <laughs> That's in Holland County and the... Uh, Sad. It's kind of sad? What's yeah. sad? Well, grandmother, when she died, the doctor, he had come from about 50 miles away the day before she died. And uh, I can remember the bed, the bed was pretty and white, and they'd put pretty white claws over her breast where, she, where this big sore was all the way from one side to the other one. And um, she, she would call for me. I was little, but I'd go out to play, and she'd say, I want little Pearlie to come here and rub my legs. Nobody can rub my legs like little Pearlie can. So I would go in, and I can remember rubbing her legs. And she said that the way I rubbed them, they felt good. I'm sure they hurt with the pain in her body like it was. And uh, when she died, three months later, my grandpa married again. And this woman had, she had five or six children. In less than a year, my grandfather didn't have nothing. He didn't have any homes. He didn't have the grocery store. He didn't have anything. He lived a long time though, right? He lived, grandpa lived until he was 93, I believe. 
he was in his 90s. He lived a long time after that, and about 18 children. He had um, 10 children by grandma, and then, then by his second wife, I think they had eight children. So altogether, he had seven, 18 children. What about your, um, your father's parents? I don't, I can barely, barely remember Grandpa Cup. I remember he was, he was very tall. He was even taller than my dad. And it, I can remember them saying he was seven foot tall, but dad said he wasn't that tall. And his hair was so red, it looked like if you'd break one, it would bleed. Mm -hmm. And I can remember sitting on his lap and running my fingers through his hair, and that's all I can ever remember about him. But my dad's mother, she died when he was, right after he was born. He, my dad was a twin, and uh, his mother died shortly after he was born. Along with his twin, right? Along, yes. Tell me about your brother and your two half-brothers. Well, my two half-brothers, they were very kind to me. We had no problems at all. But, um, Their names were? Carl and Andrew. No, Carl and Nolan. Okay. Andrew was my real brother. Right. Um, Carl and Nolan. And when they were about, they were teenagers, I don't really remember. But um, they were out cleaning out the fence row one time, and. I can just remember a little bit about it. I remember Mom and Dad talking about them being gone, and they tried to find them, and, and uh, finally they found out that their mother lived in Indianapolis, and she had sent somebody and sneaked them out and took them to Indianapolis, and from that on, why she, they stayed with her. They never come back home to live anymore, but they often come back after they grew up and got married while they come back to visit. They'd come back and visit, but, and they always treated me very nice, was very good to me. And my whole brother, he's, he's six years younger than me. I can remember when he was born, my mother, she was still having epileptic seizures, and she went into epileptic seizures, and I mean, she wouldn't wouldn't know he was born for, I don't know, hours afterward. But I went to stay with Grandpa. And uh, my aunt, she was still living at home, Mom, my mother's youngest sister, she was still living at home. And I can remember going into Grandpa's store and they'd set me up on the counter. I was glad I had a little young brother at home because I got to go stay with Grandpa. And they'd set me up on the counter and they'd say, what do you want, Pearlie? And of course, I'd tell them what I wanted. I remember when I left there, I had the most beautiful doll. It was almost as big as I was. Of course, I was little. And I had a black patent leather slippers and white anklets and a beautiful dress. And those just well, when I asked for them, I got them. Because I was the oldest grandchild, and I mean, Pearlie was it. <laughs> Tell me about your relationship with uh, Andrew growing up. Well, I was so much older than him, I think I was really mommy to him. Because <laughs> I took care of him, and, and uh, he was a mean little brat. I mean, he was a brat. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> in what way? What did he do? Well, when Homer and I were going together, he was always in my way. <laughs> oh, and, um, like the McDonald's commercial with the little boy in the suit. Right. <laughs> I guess. I don't remember it, but anyway, I guess so. Anyway, one night, <laughs> um, Homer and I and Jim Jones and his girlfriend, Maddie, Cup or Maddie Roden had uh, we were sitting out on our porch talking and of course Andrew was always bugging us always bugging us he was always there and um, 
he come around and he'd do naughty things. And uh, he did this real naughty thing in front of us all, and I got so mad at him, and, and the guys, they laughed. And uh, Maddie, she laughed. And I grabbed Andrew by the galluses. He had on overalls, and I grabbed him by the galluses. And believe me, he got a spanking before he got in the house. <laughs> he he really got a spanking. <laughs> what? Um, how did you meet uh, meet Homer? The first time I ever saw him, I was at church. I went to a prayer meeting in a person's home, and it was winter time. And in the country, people always pile their wood up behind the stove. And Homer was sitting on the wood pile. He's the most handsome guy I ever looked at in my life. He had on blue serge pants, white shirt, and a red sweater, and a tie. I can't remember what color his tie was, but he always wore a tie. That's the first time I ever, first time I met him. And. I was going with another Taylor boy, and he stood me up one night and told Homer to take me home if he wanted to. And uh, he didn't. He said he told him he he told me this later. He said I told him I had to take my sister home that night that she was with me and I couldn't. And then and later on, then well, we went to another church and uh, my cousin Maddie. Roden and myself, which later married Jim Jones, we were walking together, and and Homer come up between us, and he said, "How about me taking you girls home?" And he took hold of my arm, and he didn't bother with Maddie, and she got mad, and she went the other way, and of course he and I took off together then, mm -hmm. and uh, that was on the 23rd day of November, 1932. Yeah, 1932, I guess. Because mm -hmm. we went together one year to the day we got married. And somebody told my dad, said, uh, you better watch that guy. I said, he's going to get that girl of yours. And my dad said, better have more important business on his mind than these girls. Mm -hmm. Of course, dad, he never did like him. He'd threaten rocking him and everything. But Homer would walk, he would walk five miles to church, I mean walk through the mud and the rain. He'd walk five miles one way, take me home, and then it was five miles the other way. Hmm. And it had to be love. <laughs> it had to be love. No man would ever walk that far for any woman. Did you always go to church when you were growing up? Yes. Yes. Always, I can't never remember going to any place but church. What church did you go to? What kind of church? Well, when I was very small, I would go with friends around to the Baptist church, and then when we went to Harlan County, my mom and dad both got in Pentecostal church, and then we started going to Pentecostal church. It was when I, I was about nine years old. And um, Homer went to the same church? Yeah, he went to the same church. Then uh, tell me about getting married. Um, how did that come about? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, my dad, he, he was going to move me out of the country, which I didn't know. But my mom had told Ethel Gregory that Dad had gone to Jellicoe, Tennessee to rent a place for us to live, and he was going to move us up there so Homer couldn't see me no more. Because we'd been going together for a year, and everybody kept telling him, said, they're going to get married one of these days. And, uh, of course, Homer had already asked me to marry him, and I didn't make him any answer. I told him I wanted to think about it. And so he didn't, ask me, he didn't say nothing about it no more for about a month. And um, he said, well, what do you think about it? And I said, okay. So then we started making plans. So Dad, he left home and to get this place for us to move to. And uh, Ethel Gregory then, she told Homer. She said, um, 
if you're going to marry that girl, you better marry her because her dad's going to move her out of this country. So he told me the night before at church that he was going to go get the marriage license. So he did. Of course, I was only 15 years old. And um, he got a friend of his to go with him, and they had to hitchhike from where we lived at to Williamsburg. And uh, when they got there, they was just building the Cumberland Falls Highway then. And when they got there, well, he said he had rode one truck over, and his friend had already been over there and, and rode one back. And, and said he told him, he said, I've already been to Williamsburg. Homer said, yeah, but you haven't done what I want you to do. He said, let's go back to Williamsburg. And he told him then that he was on his way to get his marriage license. And so he went back with him. And um, Homer had wrote a, a note, given my dad's permission <laughs> to, uh, for him to get the license. And the uh, clerk said, um, are you sure Mr. Cup wrote the, this? And this friend that was with him said, yeah, I seen him write it. And this guy, he knew my dad, and he knew my dad could barely write. And Homer had a very beautiful handwriting. He knew my dad didn't write that, but nobody liked my dad. They didn't like him, so I'm sure he thought, well, I'll get even Marin Cup this way. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so he gave Homer the marriage license. That was only my suggestion that he said that. <laughs> but um, then he come back to the house and my mom was on the way to the spring to get a bucket of water. And of course she suspected what was going on. And uh, Stigler Faulkner was Homer's friend that had gone with him. And uh, he entertained my mom at the gate while Homer come in and told me he had the marriage license and he would be by the next morning to get me and wanted to know where to meet. And uh, he said, Mom had already told him that, uh, that he had to steal me, that she would not agree for us to get married. So, so we planned to elope. So uh, I had everything ready the next morning and, and I knew where to meet him at. And uh, it was about four or five miles to where we were going to get the preacher to marry us. But my mom, she had to go with us. I told her, I says, I don't want you to go with me. She says, but I am going to see who you are meeting. Because she knew there was three or four boys that would, had asked me to marry them. And I had, three or four. I had turned them down. And there was these two had really pressed it. And I told them, no, no way. And they'd say, go on, marry that Homer Taylor then. I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. So Mom, she had to go with me. And Homer, he told her, he said, well, Miss Cup said, if, if you had have agreed, we would have had a wedding where you could have been in it and been there. But said, you wouldn't agree. You told me I had to steal her. So that's what I was doing. So Mom, she gave him her blessing because she liked Homer. She didn't like these other boys. And so she gave us, gave him her blessing and she went on back home and we went, we walked, uh, we walked to this preacher's house. He wasn't at home, he'd gone to Corbin. We walked to another preacher's house, he was gone. I don't know where he was gone to. So Homer, he said, well, I know this one and um, He's too old to go any place, so we'll go to him. It was down on High Top Ridge, and he had a little store, a little grocery store. So we went there, and he married us, and the son saw us going by, and he knew what was going on, and because it was just barely mist and rain. And the son followed us down there, the minister's son. He followed us there. And uh, the minister and his wife were they his wife witnessed the wedding we went up to the store and homer he bought some after he paid the minister he had two dollars left in his pocket that's all the money he had to his name and i didn't have any and uh, he bought some crackers 
and some peppermint candy and some Vienna sausage. That was our wedding dinner, a lunch rather. And uh, this friend had uh, invited us over to their house that night. So he had to go back to his house and check on his mother and see how she was. And he milked the cow before he left her, got everything took care of for his mother because his mother wasn't very well. And we went on over to Steely Faulkner's house then. And they got out in the dark and killed chickens and fried chickens and cooked till wee hours of the night. And then we sat then by a log fire. And I mean, it was just rolling in this fire fireplace. And uh, people from all over the neighborhood, they come in. And, and uh, back them days, they rode them on the rail, shivered them. <laughs> and he told them they wasn't going to shivery Homer. So they all laughed then. And <laughs> then the next morning then, we went back over to where him and his mother lived. And we stayed, we lived there. And, and that was in November, November the 23rd. And, of what year? Um, 34. Okay, we just got you married to Homer on... November the 23rd of 1934, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and you were getting ready to tell me where you lived. We lived with uh, his mother. Homer, he lived with his mother and took care of him. Calvin, his brother, was in the service. And uh, Ben, his other brother, had just got married. And Demps, his younger brother, had just got married. All. All four boys got married inside of one year, and um, well, we lived there until Cal and Bethel got married, and we all lived in this one little bedroom house with a side room on it that was made into another bedroom. We all lived there until Cal and Bethel. Cal, he had a, a army pension because he lost an eye in the service, and. Um, we lived there until they rented a house and they moved out. And I thought, oh, they were such a rich people. They could buy furniture and they could have so much nice stuff. And, uh, but I was happy, I didn't care. And uh, after about a month went by. Where was this house at? Where, was it? Where did you live? I can't remember the name of the area, but it was, um, it was over on the high top side. I can't remember what the address was. We had a Corbin address, Corbin route. Okay. So it was on the high top side of, of um, uh, Spruce Creek. Okay. And, uh, but after... Spruce Creek as in the Spruce Creek that's part of Laurel Lake now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. And um, Homer and I went over to see my mom how they were getting along and uh, my mom was sick Homer he had a dog he called him Ring and that dog was so jealous of me <laughs> what kind of dog was it? it was just a uh, Heinz 59 <laughs> <laughs> but he was oh he was a good dog and uh, he was a he, he only liked his master Homer mm -hmm. and um uh, but when we, when we went over there, he got mad because we wouldn't let him go. And he got out and wallowed in a mud puddle and went right in the house and jumped right in our bed and wallowed on our bed. Got mud all over it. <laughs> and he never got on the bed, never. Just getting, e just getting even. Huh? Just getting even. <laughs> what did, what did uh, Homer do during this time when you first got married? What was he doing for a living? Farming. He was a farmer. He was a far uh, tenant farmer for, um, I can't think of their name. I can't remember what their name was, but it was a big farm. And, and he did all the plowing and the planting and the gathering, and then he gave them a certain amount. What, what did he grow? Corn. Then it was only corn. And we got our garden. They had the other people. They had uh, stock. Of course, the corn and the fodder was what they were interested in. 
and uh, we had our own garden, canned our own food. We had chickens, laid our eggs. We had a hog, and the hog got so fat that we couldn't eat the meat. It was so fat. <laughs> they thought they was doing something great by getting it fat. <laughs> it was tough, huh? No, it wasn't tough. Oh. It was fat. Oh, it was just full of fat. I full of fat. It so wasn't, wasn't good meat. It me. wasn't good meat. It was just fat. <laughs> uh, I couldn't eat that fat meat. And it was so big that they couldn't uh, put it up on a whatever it was they were trying to put it up on so they could uh, uh, take the intestines out of it and, and scrape it and get the hairs all off of it. It, it was a, turned out to be a total mess. <laughs> it wasn't too long after this you started having children. You yeah. had six of them, four boys and two girls. Tell me about them, starting with the oldest to youngest. <coughs> well, Felix, he was... Uh, they were all born at home except uh, Ellis. He's the only one, the youngest one, born in the hospital. Felix, he was born, we we were kind of having, uh, it was back during real bad depression, real bad depression. And Homer, he didn't have any work. And uh, the people that he was renting from, well, they, I guess they couldn't afford anything. And he worked for 50 cents a day and um, what work he could get. And my dad and mom, they, I was pregnant, and, and of course they wanted me to have the best care, and my mom knew how to take care of me. And she was going to deliver the baby. So uh, we, they divided their house. They made it into a duplex, and we lived in one end of it, and mom and dad lived in the other end of it. By this time, had your dad accepted Homer? To some extent, but he got mad at him again <laughs> 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 because uh, there just wasn't any work to do. And uh, he thought because Homer would go swimming on, on Sunday or sometime on Saturday, he would go swimming with some of the other guys and, and leave me alone. Why, Dad just thought that was a no-no. He should never leave me. But, uh, well, I understood he needed, he needed to get away. But that was his own, only, own, only thing that he ever did, you know, as far as sports or something like that, hunting. He loved to hunt. But um, Dad, he kind of got a little angry at him then, but it all blew over. He'd always, he'd always get in a good humor with him, and, and uh, things, it turned out all right. And when Felix was born, well, of course, that was the one and only grandchild at that time. And uh, he was, they tried to spoil him, but I guess he couldn't be spoiled because he was a very good baby, very good. And um, Homer's mother, she, she had a stroke about the time Felix was born. And uh, when he was uh, about a month old, well, we went to, um, he was born in February, February the 3rd. Of what year? Uh, 1936. And um, we went over to Corbin to see Homer's mother because she'd had a stroke and she could, she was paralyzed. She couldn't talk or anything. And I went up to, I spent the night with his sister, Hannah Barton. And uh, I remember the next morning, it, oh, it was almost zero. And here I was giving Felix a bath, and everybody was telling me I was going to kill that baby if I give him baths like that. I told him, no, babies had to be clean. Mm -hmm. And I gave him a bath, and I bundled him up and took him back down to see Grandma Taylor. And then Homer, he took us on home then, and uh, then they moved her from Dempsey's house in Corbin. They moved her to Cal and Bethel's house over on High Top Ridge, and uh, that's where she died at, was at their house. But she got till she could, she could talk after she went there, and I took Felix over there so she could see him, and he was just big enough that he, if he got a blanket over his face while he 
his hands and his feet started to work at the same time and she got scared she thought there was rats underneath of the blanket trying to get him <laughs> <laughs> and then she told us she said there's nobody that'll ever have a baby as pretty as this baby is this is the prettiest baby i've ever seen in my life so you can say your daddy was very handsome mike <laughs> next child was zester I wanted a girl so bad that I cried when he was born because he was a boy. He was the ugliest little thing ever I seen my life. <laughs> I mean, he was ugly. <laughs> and, but uh, it wasn't, it didn't take many days, many hours for me to start thinking he was handsome and, and a real pretty little boy and they both Felix was always jealous of him. He, he never wanted to share. There wasn't that much difference between them. There was only like about two years, I think, maybe a little over two years. But he never liked to share. His things was his things. And we had a hard time teaching him to share because their toys was mostly what their dad made for them. He made them a, a wheelbarrow and he made it out of cardboard. I don't remember what he'd use for a wheel, but he, he made a wheel. He made a neat little um, wheelbarrow. And we had to force Felix to let Zester play with it, and then he wouldn't play it no more, so we had to force him to get a hold of it and play with it again. <laughs> <laughs> Next, though, you finally got your girl. Yeah, Retha, she came, and we were so happy. Got my girl. And uh, we had a, na a neighbor that was named Retha. Her name was Retha Campbell. So we named, she was a diabetic and she died with, and then when Retha was, was born, why well, we called her Retha because we loved the girl so much. And uh, then just 22 months later, while well, there was another girl <laughs> and that was Ruth. And she was another ugly one. <laughs> I wasn't disappointed with her, but she was so ugly. I think Zester and her both, they were so skinny. I was in very poor health. And I think that I was so skinny, so poor, and not very healthy, that they, they were healthy babies, but they, weren't, they didn't have any flesh on them. Mm -hmm. But Ruth, she grew up to be a very beautiful little girl with curled hair. Oh, her hair was so beautiful, curly. Retha's hair was blonde and straight, and and Ruth was, um, I can't think of what color it was, auburn. And just, it was just beautiful curls. She had one curl that hung down over her forehead, and Retha sneaked and cut it off. I went out on the porch one day, and I said, who done this? <laughs> and Ruth said, Rita, I didn't like it no way. <laughs> so needless to say, Rita got a spanking. And then about two years later, then I had another boy. It was Herschel. And, uh, by then, my babies were babies. <laughs> it was kind of hard to really, really, I enjoyed them, but I had other work to do with others and that one, and, mm -hmm. and we thought it was all over with. That was the fifth, uh, the fifth one. It was over with. We wasn't going to have no more. Well, to our surprise, six years later, we had another one. Uh, four years later, four years later, we had another one. That was Ellis. And they spoiled him rotten. Uh, uh, the, Rita, she thought when he was a month old, he should be able to sit up in a chair. So she picked him up and set him in a chair, and he fell, fell through the back end of the floor. <laughs> <laughs> 
He <laughs> landed on his head. Is that... He must have landed on his head because he come up with a lot of sense. <laughs> 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 when Felix rolled off the bed the first time, I cried, and my mom said, "You know, they got to fall on their head a few times before they have any knowledge." So I guess that's reason. My children have all got plenty of knowledge because they all fell on their heads. <laughs> but Ellis, they just, everybody spoiled him rotten. And then after he got up a little bit bigger, well, he was wanting so many things and and they'd start blaming me because I spoiled him. And I said, I didn't spoil him, you did. Because at his demand, he got everything. And <laughs> What year was Ellis born? 1949. So it wasn't too many years after that you guys left Kentucky, right? No, it wasn't too long. We, it was uh, about, uh, it must have been about 50, 54 when we left Kentucky. What was the reason? The reason? Felix was going into college. Zester was, he was a senior in high school. And it wouldn't be long till we'd have all six of them in school and the farm life you we could not make a living on it because homer was already he was already working in cincinnati he couldn't stay on the farm very long because i don't think he stayed over two years on the or one year on the farm because uh, with that many children in school and everything we had to buy everything but we had cows and the children had everything on the farm that a farm life could be. And I'm glad because they learned things on the farm that they would have never learned anyplace else. They learned about chickens, they learned about pigs, they learned how to take care of the, the animals. Zester had a horse, he had a mule of his own. And the other kids all played with, uh, we had a big black mare but they had a tractor and all the equipment to go with the tractor that they took care of the farm with. And uh, they just had a, I think they had a great life on the farm. They had cats, they had dogs, they had everything that a farm life would lead to, they had. And Felix, he, we, we had a car and somebody had cheated us with it. So Homer, he went and bought another car and Felix took all the parts out of one motor and built the other motor. Now he was only a teenager and he built the other motor and hit run when he got finished with it, hit run. And just different things that they, they just learned so much. They learned how to milk, milk a cow. Felix, he learned how to butcher a hog. I, I'd trust Felix and Zester, Zester wasn't as much to go ahead with something as Felix was. Felix was more like the daddy of the group. He went ahead and he, he, he would butcher these hogs and I mean he would cut them up so beautiful. And by this time, while well, we could freeze some, but we canned a lot of it. We didn't have much of a way to, to freeze it. We didn't have a freezer just top of our refrigerator. But um, we'd have chickens and everything, but life just got too much. And the boys for their spending money, well, we had a tobacco base on the farm and they would grow tobacco and they would have some spending money. I don't remember just what their daddy would give from, for it. I really didn't know. And but I mean they took care of all the stuff like that. The boys did all the outside work. I never made them walk, come inside after the girls got big enough to do dishes. The boys didn't do dishes no more. They they did the outside work when we went on the farm. They did outside, and the girls helped me in the house. Uh, did everyone go to Cincinnati when you left? Or no, no. That was to my breaking of my heart. We left uh, Felix with his grandpa and grandma and Zester both. And I think they fought. I know those two couldn't get along too good. 
<laughs> you think they fought after you left? I know they did. <laughs> I think they about scared Grandpa and Grandma to death. <laughs> so, in the middle, of, but see, it was in November when we moved. It seemed like all of our important dates was in November. We moved to Cincinnati in November, and that was in the middle of the semester. So we left Felix and Zester both, because Felix, see, he was graduating in 19... 55 from high school and uh, it would we waited till the middle of the semester to take Zester to Cincinnati and uh, Felix he stayed on then and graduated from Woodbine High School and uh, Zester though he went to Cincinnati and I tell you I just it broke my heart it still hurts to think about leaving Felix and separating him from the family. How did those teenage girls take that move to Cincinnati? Well, they wasn't... They, I think they liked it. Really? I think they liked it because there was more to do and everything. But um, we were still... I mean, we were poor. I couldn't buy the they went to Indian Hill School and Indian Hill was rich people mm. and uh, I couldn't afford the clothing that they needed so I went up there and I got me a job in 1955 and the first of the year September of 1955 I got a job and um, at the school at the school working as a cook a substitute and um, I would just fill in, there was some of the women that was on Social Security and they could only work a certain amount of time and they had to cut off or they'd take their Social Security away. So I would fill in when they would take off. So at the end of 1955, they hired me permanent and hired another girl as substitute. And uh, I went on permanent then and I, I told all the children, Felix by this time was in college and I think he started in college in 1955 at Berea and um, I told him all I said you will have more by me working because we just could not afford to to buy clothing and buy food and pay rent of course rent then was only $64 a month <laughs> It wasn't bad, but $64 a month back then was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And um, we would buy yard goods, and I would, I would sew and teach the girls to sew, and we would make their clothes. But um, I worked there, and it was really nice because I could go to school on the school bus with the children. And when they got off from school, I rode back home with them. So I was with them all the time. But then the next year, they wouldn't, insurance wouldn't let me ride. So mm -hmm. I, I had to get another way to school. By this time, we had moved to Remington. And um, another girl picked me up, and I paid her $10 a month to pick me up, which wasn't much, but, I mean, that bought gas then. Right. And what did Grandpa do when he moved to Cincinnati? Him and Grandma, they stayed, they moved into our house. See, they had uh, bought a little track of land and built them a house. And um, they uh, they stayed in in our house. They called it the big house. They stayed in, in our house until Grandma got sick. She got a blood clot in her leg. And uh, Grandpa didn't, he didn't trust the doctors at Corbin, so he brought her to Cincinnati and put her in the hospital there and uh, then eventually they moved to Cincinnati. They didn't, they didn't live there too long till, I don't know, they were like rolling stones. <laughs> they just, they never gathered any moss, but uh, they, they lived there a while and then they moved back to Corbin and then they moved back to Cincinnati and they were going to rent and uh, he come to bed, Homer, 
he came to him, my dad came to Homer, and and asked him to go down to a furniture store. He was going to buy some used furniture to put in their apartment. You could rent a flat and get it very, fairly cheap if you furnished it. So uh, he went down with him, and uh, my dad was going to buy it on time, and Homer told him, he said, no, you're not going to buy that on time. He said, I'm going to pay for it. And Dad said, well, I can pay so much a month. And Homer, he says, no, it's going to eat you up in interest. I'm going to pay for this. And you can pay me back when you want to. Whatever way you want to do it, you can pay me back. If you want to, if not, well, that's okay, too. So they took the furniture on out, and Homer, he paid for it. And Dad, he did. He paid it back. When he got it, he got him a job. He worked during the uh, war. He worked at a defense plant. I can't remember the name of the plant, but he worked there. And uh, he worked as a, a guard, I think, or a maintenance man. I don't remember just what it was. Anyway, he worked there during the war. During which war? Uh, World War II. Okay. So this was in the 40s then, mm -hmm. before you in moved? In the 40s. Mm -hmm. Before you moved to Cincinnati? Before, this was before that we had moved to the farm the first time. Okay. <laughs> I went, I went way back. <laughs> okay. Okay. Tell me what uh, uh, Homer did in Cincinnati when he was working in Cincinnati. He, he got a job at a... He first, uh, he, he first went to school and uh, he got so many hours he would work days and go to school at night until he got so many hours of machinist and then um, his brother Ben come out and wanted to go with him to find a job because he didn't know his way around and uh, Homer went with him and Homer got the job and Ben didn't <laughs> mm. and where was that job at American at? Can Company American Can uh -huh. Is that, did that become he can can no no American me. American moved to New York okay. Homer he worked there 10 years and that's when we moved to the farm okay as we bought the farm after 10 years he had worked there and they wanted him to go to New York and he wouldn't go to New York okay then when he went to the farm and he stayed down there about a year and we couldn't we couldn't make a living on the farm well then he went back and got a job at the Hecon. okay and, and when, he, when what year was that Six, it would have been the 60s that would no. no when he went back it would have been uh, 19 and see that was when we moved there 1954. okay so he got the job there and but he had worked there it was in the in the 50s he worked there all during the 50s because he worked uh, he worked at uh, he can can for 20 23 years i think okay so he actually worked in cincinnati back in the 40s then yeah okay back when you were still having children at the right time. he he was working there when uh, herschel was born and i don't remember what year he was born <laughs> So, uh, so he was. So he actually went up there in the '40s and worked, yeah. and that was that was when during the war and everything when yeah. uh, when Grandpa went up there, mm -hmm. and then he went back in, in the '50s and got the job at Heakin, and you guys moved up there and stayed mm -hmm. from then on, and, and he worked at Heakin, and you worked at the school system mm -hmm. all the way through till you retired. Right. He re he retired in 1973, but um, I was going to just draw my money out and not, you know, and just quit and they told me said the even the principal of the school came to me and talked to me and told me he said leave your money in the school system and then when you get 62 years old he said you'll draw pension mm -hmm. and I did I left it in and I'm thankful now because I'm still drawing it <laughs> I'm very lucky and they're also paying my insurance right. with Aetna you guys retired to Florida originally and then London and back to Florida again um, why, why did you pick Florida? I know you went on a lot of uh, vacations to Florida before you retired. Well, Homer always said he wanted to go to a warmer climate when he retired. And uh, his niece, Gladys Tidwell, lived here. And uh, she just enticed us to come here. This has been an interview with Pearl Taylor.